Hello, everybody. I'm Renee Reyes, Director of Programming here at the Paley Center in Los Angeles. And behalf of our, on behalf of our President and CEO, Maureen Reedy, who is watching us tonight in New York, where we're hosting the Paley Center's International Council, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first event in our new series of Paley Media Council Dialogues. Tonight, of course, we are thrilled to welcome the President and Chief Content Officer of Warner Brothers Television Group, Peter Roth. Thank you, Peter. And also writer, director, producer, extraordinaire, Greg Berlanti. Yeah. Yeah. It's great to see so many of you here tonight, so many of you who braved the warm California winter weather <laughs> to join us. Hello to all of you watching us on live stream around the country where I would assume you couldn't go to the beach today, but you can hear global warming it does exist. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank, take a moment before we get started to take our our, thank our sponsor, Film LA, for making this whole series of events possible. <laughs> Thanks, Film LA. I'm sure many of you who are here tonight are familiar with the organization. They're a terrific nonprofit non that coordinates and processes permits for on-location motion picture, television, commercial production throughout Los Angeles. And we're thrilled tonight to welcome their uh, executive vice president, Art Yoon, who is here with us tonight. Thank you, Art, and thank you, Film LA. <laughs> I also want to offer a special welcome to the Media Council members who are here with us tonight. The Media Council is our uh, membership group of executives like yourselves, and we host wonderful evenings like this throughout the year, both here in LA and also in New York. We have some events coming up in, on December uh, 17th. We'll be welcoming uh, David Nevins of Showtime, and on January 28th, Dana Walden and Gary Newman of Fox. So we'll hope to see many of you there for those events as well. To kick off our program, though, it's my pleasure to welcome another uh, board member of the Paley Center. Kevin Beggs is, of course, the chairman of Lionsgate Television Group, overseeing development and production of all scripted and non-scripted programming for broadcast, cable, and digital platforms worldwide. Under his leadership, Lionsgate roster has grown to encompass more than 30 television series on 20 different networks, as well as nearly 2,000 hours of original programming licensed around the world. And we all know uh, their critically, critically acclaimed programming, including Mad Men and Orange is the New Black and Casual and Manhattan. Uh, and we're thrilled he's here with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kevin Beggs. Thank you so much. Good evening. Tonight, on behalf of the Paley Center's Los Angeles Board of Governors, I'm delighted to welcome you to the first in a new series of Paley Media Council Dialogues. It's great to see so many members of the Paley community here tonight, Paley Center trustees, my fellow board members, and media council members, and it's especially great to see so many of you who are perhaps here with us for the first time. We welcome you, and I personally encourage you to get involved with the Paley Center, become a member, and attend other events like this, both here in LA and in New York, where you'll always find yourself in good company. And speaking of good company, we're in especially good company this evening with a wonderful group of special guests. I now have the pleasure of welcoming to the stage. Peter Roth is, of course, one of the most respected executives in the entertainment industry, working for the gold standard in television, Warner Brothers. As president and chief content officer of Warner Brothers Television Group, he has creative responsibility for all of Warner Brothers Television, the group's production activities worldwide, and oversight of Warner Brothers Television, Warner Horizon, Warner Brothers Animation, Telepictures, Shed Media, and Warner Brothers International TV production. I don't know when he sleeps. Under Peter's leadership, Warner Brothers Television has supplied current hit series to the major broadcast and cable networks, including The Big Bang Theory, Mom, The Middle, Undateable, The Vampire Diaries, Persons of Interest, The Leftovers, and Gotham, to name just a few. He is joined in conversation by one of the most prolific and successful writer, producer, director, showrunners working today, Greg Berlanti who has not only revolutionized genre TV, but also spearheaded some of television's most insightful and engaging dramas. From early hits like Everwood and Brothers and Sisters to the no less than six current series, his Berlanti production shingle and Warner Brothers Television are producing, which include Arrow, The Flash, The Mysteries of Laura, new hit dramas Blindspot and Supergirl, and the upcoming DC's Legend of Tomorrow. Both gentlemen are frequent presence are a frequent presence here at the Paley Center with series honored multiple times at our Paley Live and Paley Fest events. Hosting them in conversation this evening is our good friend, Deborah Birnbaum, 
Deborah is an accomplished editor and media strategist with more than 20 years of experience covering news and entertainment. As president and editor-in-chief of TV Guide magazine, she helped revitalize a classic brand. Now we're happy to have her on the West Coast as the executive editor for TV at Variety, where she oversees all television coverage for the trade magazine's multiple platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Greg Berlanti, my fellow Paley board member Peter Roth, and Deborah Birnbaum. Sounds so impressive. <laughs> so let's start with the report card on fall TV. We're two months into the season. How are you feeling the season's going? Well, thanks to Mr. Berlanti, the season has started off quite well for our company. Um, for those of you who don't know, Greg is currently shepherding the numbers one and two highest rated new series of the year with a third series, Legends of Tomorrow, that we have very high hopes for on January the 21st. So. From our perspective, again, thanks to my friend and protege, we're having a very good year. Beyond that, and I think of equal importance, is the fact that I think it's been a good year, a solid year thus far for broadcast television. I think the manner in which our consumers are now absorbing their product is certainly different. The traditional linear me measurement is no longer, I think, nearly as applicable or as, or as realistic as it once was. I think once we see all the measurements from Live 3, Live 7, binging, the opportunities that, that viewers have, I think you're going to see that there are many, many shows that will have emerged, Quantico, Limitless, uh, some of the comedies on Fox, certainly what happened last year with Empire. It's still a thriving and a very vibrant business. Greg, Peter mentioned blind spot and Supergirl, what's the secret of your success? Uh, I mean, I think we're just, uh, everyone at the company is, we're, we're trying to make shows that excite and interest us. I, it's definitely, as everyone who works in TV knows, it's, it's, it's a, we're in some kind of in-between period where, you know, people are trying to find their way. And so I think we just, we double down on, uh, you know, what are the stories and the kind of shows we would want to watch and be excited by, and who are the writers and directors and actors that we're excited by. And, and I really feel like, uh, you know, when in doubt, that that's ultimately just even as a viewer what, what I get interested in. And, uh, and so if there's any, any kind of secret, I think it's that. And, and, you know, always the same good luck and, and a lot of years working with a lot of the same very talented people who have, are really responsible as much as I am for any of the good fortune that we're, we're having right now. One of the successes your studio has definitely had is reviving the superhero genre. How did you come up with the idea of doing that? How did that start? Well, it started honestly with Greg. You know, when we were lucky enough to bring Greg back to our studio back in 2011, it was, it was his notion, it was his vision, it was his idea to take the existing DC properties and to really revitalize it, contemporize it, make it relevant, make it relatable to the audience. And it began with Arrow, which was, I remember when I heard the idea for the first time at lunch, literally jumping out of my seat thinking, oh my god, that's brilliant, of course. And then literally, about six months later at another lunch, he said to me, what if we were actually to introduce the flash within the world of Arrow? And so the notion of taking these iconic properties and using them as a platform to introduce all of these other great characters really was born and the vision is his, and without exaggeration. Um, well, <laughs> I, I came back to Warner's, as he said, and you know, I had participated in a film called Green Lantern, uh, which wasn't the best experience for me. Uh, for a number of reasons, it wasn't really sort of what I had seen and written in my head. It was kind of taken from us, and somebody, everybody else sort of did something very different with it. And, and, but I came back, and Peter, in spite of that, said, why don't you do a DC show? And he's probably the most convincing man in, in Hollywood. And uh, I said, well, you know, if I were to do one, the one that would interest me the most was, is Arrow, uh, in part because there's a way to do, there's a reason to do that show at the time. You know, I really felt like there was a reason to do it on television, and that his origin story could happen concurrently 
with the rest of the show. And you know, in a film, you'd get the origin story done in 20 minutes, and you'd be on to you know, they're sort of the hero. But here, we could sort of tell them simultaneously. Uh, and, and so that was sort of the initial kind of impulse for it. The, o the other thing that's great about Peter is Peter can like will shows to happen. And so you know if you can get him invested and interested in sort of like seeing it. Uh, I remember, you know, though I wasn't a part of Smallville, I was at the studio at the time doing Everwood. And I remember how that was just as much his child as anybody else's. And, and so when we started talking about the DC properties again, um, you know, Arrow was, was at the top of our list. But it was also sort of about how can we do it in a way, it wasn't the same time as Smallville, you know? How could we do it in a way for a contemporary audience? And, and we talked about things like, you know, the Bourne films, and we talked about Homeland, and, and uh, you know, a mysterious stranger coming back, and we don't sort of know much about him. And then, truth, truthfully, if it wasn't, you know, The Flash had always been my favorite character as a, as a comic book character, and I'd always dreamed of participating in, you know, telling that story somehow. Um, but had, it, had Arrow not been successful, we wouldn't have sort of gone there. But once it, it started to work, the hope was, okay, now can we introduce you know, powers to this universe? And, uh, and, and there's really a, there's such a, we've got kind of a core group of people, both in production and, and uh, in the executive suites, you know, and then at the network as well, and, uh, and then up in Vancouver where we make the show. You know? um, and, and it really, it's just sort of, it breeds uh, more ideas and more characters, and, and uh, I've been really fortunate to sort of help shepherd that along. But, um, but the exciting part about it for me with something like Arrow was to sort of, I think, be on the same page as someone like Peter and to know, you know that actually, as hard as TV is to, to make, you never know if it's going to work or not. But actually, if, if everyone sort of has the same sort of shared vision, you, you really better the odds. And, uh, and that was, I really felt that with that project and, and since, you know, with those other projects. If I just add, mm -hmm. I think if there's one thing that Greg and I and Greg's teams and frankly my team all share is a genuine love for these properties. You know, I think we both, we actually grew up in a neighborhood close to each other, a different generation. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is that we each share an incredible passion for these properties a love, a genuine affection for them. We feel responsibility as gatekeepers to make these projects as relatable, as powerful, and as impactful for the audiences as humanly possible. And that love, that genuine affection for these characters, I think, when executed properly, translates to the audience. And I think it's a bit of a lost art in television, is that the play is the thing. So given that, how do you decide which characters you're going to introduce? How do you decide which ones you're going to roll out next? You know, it, sometimes it just comes out of the popularity of the, you know, obviously with Arrow, it was, it was the Arrow specific. And then with Flash, it was just a, a, a personal favorite of mine. But beyond that, a lot of it's come out of, of you know, the popularity of those certain characters uh, as they've appeared. You know, and you just, you just never know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a synergistic alchemy of, of you know, the, the casting, which is so key. And, and I would say if there's areas that we sort of share in common that we sort of focus on throughout, you know, it, it, it is in story and then in script and then casting is, is so much of it. And, you know, and uh, I remember the day that I brought, you know, we had a few people we were looking at um, uh, for Flash and I brought the tape to Peter's office, just him and I in his, in his office. It was a DVD, it wasn't a tape. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm dating myself now. So uh, I brought the, the DVD to his office and we popped it in and I didn't tell him, I never tell him who my favorite is, but I watch his reaction. And uh, he had the same reaction, which was Grant was younger than we were all thinking initially, but he was the best. He was the Flash. He embodied the spirit and the soul of the character. And, uh, and we also knew in casting that, that we were, that everybody else, the series had been going. And so here it was sort of, you know, he had to join a series that was working, not with superpowers, not with a suit, but just as, you know, Barry Allen and come in and be fascinating enough that you that everyone believe you could build a show around. And so it was so dependent on his abilities as an actor. And Peter watched it and he said, well, that's your guy. I don't even want to watch the next guy. <laughs> and, and, and so uh, he knew. And, uh, and that, I think we sort of, uh, sort of locked arms in that. And that, ha that happens a lot. And with a lot of the successful characters, that's been the case where there's just been, we've all been sort of Felicity, you know, Emily Bett Records who plays Felicity was a guest star. And, and she was in the fourth, I think she appeared first in the fourth episode. Uh, as a day player, and Peter called us up right away and said, well, well, who's this girl, you know? And uh, we, we gotta lock her up. <laughs> and and uh, so you get that kind of 
uh, I think everybody sort of has the same kind of visceral response. Okay, I have to just, I have to comment on this. Right. Because while that's very generous of you, it's and true. I, really, I appreciate that, the fact of the matter is, is that anybody who works and loves television knows that there are two key ingredients, a close-up and a script. Greg provides vision, conceit, concepts, and a script that is so compelling and so personal and so emotional, and that's 50% of every great show. But I believe, and I, I really mean this, that your, your greatest skill is your ability to find and see the next great actor. And it goes back to Everwood, when Chris Pratt was cast as a, he was a then unknown Chris Pratt, Emily Van Camp, Gregory Smith, and the list goes on, Matt Bomer. Over the years, it's, it's extraordinary who he's brought to the company. And his taste, his, his connection to these actors in conjunction with these great and beautiful stories is what makes for great television. So thank you for giving me the credit, but it really is you, my friend. I was shared. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Tell the story about how you first met. Tell the story about that Everwood script. Oh, God. OK. Well, I'm going to embarrass myself, so please forgive me. <laughs> it was November of 2001, and the entire country was still reeling from the horror of 9-11. And I was given this spec script that Greg had written. I really didn't know Greg. I knew that he was the wunderkind that had been so successful in shepherding Dawson's Creek. I knew that he was an extraordinary young man, I had been told by many people. And I remember sitting in the backyard of my house in this sunny November day, reading the script, and forget, I'll embarrass myself, I was weeping in reading this. Because I thought, I, I don't know that I could have ever read a script that was as perfect a metaphor for the pain that we were feeling as a nation individualized in the form of what happened to Andy, the protagonist in the piece. Life was going on. We took life for granted. He was doing his best. All was well. But we all live life in, 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 you know, without really taking into consideration the true value of life. And then a tragedy hits. And that's what happened to Andy. And the result was that his life was never the same as happened for all of us here in this country. And the antidote was to move and to change his life, to alter his system, to reorient himself from his life as a workaholic doctor to becoming a loving, caring father. And I remember thinking to myself, this is one of the most beautiful stories I've ever read. I will tell you that after reading, I think I called my wife and said, I just read a script as I'm weeping that I love so much, I called my entire team and I said, no matter what happens, we are producing this show. And that was my introduction to, to Greg. What's your version of the story? Um, I had, I, <laughs> I, 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 I pitched two shows that year. I was working at Sony because I was in a deal at Sony at the time um, doing Dawson's. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had to develop something and I had one that was very personal to me, which was Everwood. And I had another thing that I pitched that sold for a lot of money and then the, the, uh, the Everwood one, I, I just, I sold it to WB at the time directly because I had a relationship with them. And uh, I handed it in, I think on September 9th. Wow. I think I literally finished the script on September 6th or 9th or something like that. It has September in the title and I handed it in and, uh, and so then the events of September 11th happened and uh, everybody sort of pushed pause and then a month later, I think it was something like that. The head of Sony at the time called me and said, um, we're, not, we're not making television shows this year. Um, so they decided that year, I think they pushed pause on development that year. Um, but go with God and see who's out there. And, and I, I guess the script was being submitted around. I didn't really have a sense of anything. All I know is I got a call from Peter Roth. And uh, he said, we have to meet for dinner. <laughs> So he's the only person who asked to meet for, uh, for dinner. Otherwise, I was going into people's offices. So we went to dinner on Ventura, and I met with you and uh, a few other executives who were working with him at the time. And, and he sort of would tell, he told me the story of the pilot back to me <laughs> as though I had never read it. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and it was so engaging, I thought, wow, OK. And I, I didn't realize at the time, there's a lot about that 
because it was sort of the, the first, there was a lot about it that was very magical and I could never replicate even if I tried. But one of the things that I didn't realize at the time that has become really essential and important to me since is to have a real patron in what I do uh, and to actually have somebody who sees the thing that's an executive, be it at a network or at a studio, that sees it as clearly as you do to help get you through all, across all the hurdles and things that you're going to have to uh, get across to make a great show. You really need that partnership. And that was kismet. It just sort of happened uh, by fate. But um, all the things I've been a part of that have been successful um, really had that. And a lot of the things that I've been a part of that maybe haven't worked uh, didn't always have that, you know, and, and were maybe manipulated in a way as opposed to just something just so organic. And uh, so that's what I remember most about that, that connection. It's beautiful. Oh, wonderful. It's just true. So talk about your relationship. How do you guys work together on a day-to-day -day basis? Would you like to take that, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's changed through the years. Yeah. I mean, we interface uh, a lot more. I used to be just terrified when you call. Uh, you look scared, like, oh, no, he called. Uh, and uh, um, anyway, so, but now, now it's more, more casual in that way. I think, um, uh, you know, it, it's, we, there's, there, to me, there's very key moments in, this sh in a show's life or pilot's life um, in terms of shaping what the story is, one of the places and times of the year we interface the most is you know every pilot pitch that we work on for hours and hours. I bring it to Peter and we pitch it to him and uh, get his notes and his thoughts. And then we go out, we take it out sometimes together or sometimes just with his sort of advice of go here or go there. And then the next key moment you know in the, in the show's life is when the script comes in. And sometimes uh, you know he'll just send a set of notes or sometimes he'll come over to my office if it's like a real key point and there's been things through the years that we haven't agreed on where you know he'll say well what's your vi what are you what are you trying to do with this because that's not what I'm getting or you know uh, and then or or I don't agree or I do agree and here's why and sometimes you know uh, we'll we'll agree to disagree and other times we'll actually like come up with a better solution for it and then it's the you know then the drafts written and and then we lock arms and then again it's the next time is in casting so I think in the idea and the concept and the pitch and then in the script, and then in the casting. And, and those, are, those are the most essential parts where you can really, I think, affect the life and the quality of, of what the thing is that you're doing. And that's probably when we interface, I, I would say, the most. You, you know, I, I think that a good executive, his most response or her most, res most important responsibility is to identify the best talent and then to platform that talent to do their absolute best work, to create an environment where they feel supported, appreciated, loved, and oftentimes what we really do mostly is to downfield block on behalf of Greg, to, to keep the vision as pure and as perfect as we possibly can. It's a very tough business with a lot of different personalities and egos, all of whom would like to have and be a part of the, of the process. Our job is to, is to filter out the ideas that we don't think will work quite as well and to ensure that the best ideas always win. And what I know with Greg, in, in, in the final analysis, from my perspective, Greg has the final say. Because when, and we have disagreed, we have had different po points of view, but m my job is to support him, to hire him. I'm dependent on his success. So if I give a note, as an example, that either he doesn't agree with, understand, or unwittingly is unable to, to really execute, then my imposition on him makes no sense whatsoever. He is the creator, he is the producer, I am the viewer. I think that's the role that I like to play with him most. I love, and my team love television. So we try to be an objective eye for him. We try to give back to him and we'll say to him, we're not quite sure what you're going for in this scene. We're not feeling it. Can you help us realize that? And that's where I think our communication is most effective. And we really do share both a passion, not only for a vision, but to make the best show imaginable. And I think that's, uh, yeah. Cool. What are the biggest challenges you face? I believe the biggest challenge that we face in television today is fear. I, I think that the business has changed so radically. There is so much pressure economically from the corporations and their vertically aligned studios 
there is a diminution of relevance for audiences. Audiences don't really care about the corporate agenda. They really couldn't care less. All they want is they want the best shows in which they can watch at their convenience with greater control and have greater choice. That is the agenda of the consumer, of the buyer. It, it's our job to ensure that that happen. And unfortunately, with as much pressure, with as much, these are, this is big stakes poker, lots and lots, billions and billions of dollars are at stake. And as a result, when the ratings are as challenged as they are, when the traditional system is as challenged, it often evokes a lot of fear in the part of many, many executives. And I think, that's, I think that can be, at times, choking to the process. And I think part of what we have to do is to open people's minds up, open up the possibilities of allowing our creators and our producers to realize the best of the vision. I would rather fail with Greg's vision of what will work than to be imposed upon by somebody who thinks that they know better who really don't. What about for you as a producer? What are your biggest challenges? I mean, just off the top of my head, I'd say just how competitive everything's gotten in the sense of, on, on a couple of different levels. One is just the amount of everything there is for other people to do. They can go online, they can watch other shows, they can watch any show in the history of shows. <laughs> so you're, you're not just competing with everything that's sort of on your time slot or whatever. You're really competing with all of these other possibilities uh, to, to grab people's interest out the gate, to maintain it every week, to maintain it against you know, other shows that are still in your, in your time slot. So I'd say th that part of it. The other part of it I would say is if you're doing something that is a network-based show, the, the quality of just the look of it and the size and the scope of it, you know, people, they don't, I don't, I don't believe they really see television shows and movies as different anymore. They expect the same quality. They expect the same look. They expect the same um, feel and emotion and scope, if, uh, especially if it's a high concept or a big idea. And so we're working you know, to try and give people that same feeling so that if they flip the channel to a movie channel, they're not going to see a big depreciation from the look and the feel of the thing. So I think the production, uh, production elements have gotten just a lot bigger and more challenging in terms of just on a TV schedule and budget. And, uh, and I just think just in general, the competitiveness of, of all the other things that can appeal to people. On that note, I've heard someone say there's too much TV. <laughs> Do you feel that? No. I, I, I don't. <laughs> Good. I, I, no, I don't. I, I think that that quote, there's too much t TV, was amended by another very wise executive who said, there is not enough great TV. And I, that is the point. Y you know, there are clearly many more choices available to the viewer today as there should be. There are now over 400 scripted series on television available to any viewer at any given time. What we aspire to do, and the reason why Greg Berlanti is sitting up here, is that our job is to hire the best people and then to try to encourage them and galvanize them and inspire them to do the best work. Great has to win out. Good is no longer good enough. There's simply too many choices for the viewer. So I absolutely do not think there is too much TV. I think there is not nearly enough great TV. And the great TV always, and in my 41 year history in television, the great television series always rises to the top. It always finds its audience. So I would, and I subscribe to that theory. How is the great TV gonna win out? Just keep making the best shows you can? Absolutely. You know, what's interesting is, because there are so many ponders, platforms, there's binging, there's time shifting, there's, there is the, the diminution of linear television. All of those factors are true. It's no different than when I started in 1975 when there were three broadcast networks and on average about two independent stations per city. The best shows always won out and the worst shows were canceled. Now they were canceled at a 28 share but the fact of the matter is, okay, that was a little different. But no matter how much things change, no matter what the distribution platforms, no matter how viewers consume their product, 
they understand and discern the difference between great, compelling, must see, have to watch, my life will not be the same if I'm not able to connect with this particular character. That will always be, and I am absolutely convinced of that. It's the one truth, as I've heard over the years, all of the many pontifications about this works and this doesn't work, and I, I've heard them all from, we don't program in the summer because the summer economically makes no sense for us to invest. You know, comedy is dead. You know, the pilot system doesn't work. You know, I, I don't want to embarrass my friend, but you know, we should be programming at 10 o'clock for margins. Not, I, I listen to all this and I think, you're embarrassing yourself and you're showing your disdain for the process. That's not the way viewers consume their television. They just don't think that way. And I, my favorite quote in 1984 was when there was a declaration that comedy was dead. As a matter of fact, there was an HRTS luncheon, Kevin. An HRTS luncheon where three, there were only three broadcast networks. The three heads of the networks were asked the seminal question, is comedy dead? And two of the three, including my boss at the time, I'm embarrassed for him, said, absolutely. Nine of the top 10 shows in television are dramas, Clearly, comedy is no longer relevant. It's become predictable. It just has no place in television. And the third head of the network, one Grant Tinker, said, until there's a funny one. <laughs> and it's, it just, it, it proves the, it, it's all nonsense. We don't know. We're dealing with the public taste. We're privileged to deal with the public taste. And so our job is to simply is to give the best of who we think we are, of what we think viewers will watch, that is worth their while, that's compelling, that hopefully enriches their life. Yeah, that was very well put. I, I, <laughs> well, I'm not sure what I can add to that. <laughs> so Greg, I've got to ask, you've got six shows on your plate. How do you juggle them all? You know, I, I, it's, you manage your day. I mean, I think even when I just had Truthfully, when I was doing one show, you, you figure out a way to spend all your time doing it. You just, it forces you to sort of manage things um, better, I think. Um, you know, each, each show has a person that I, I mean, the, the easiest way for me to answer the question is, I really associate the shows with the people that I work with. And so when I go into a room and I'm just working with Andrew, or I'm working with Martin, or I'm working with Jeff Rake, or I'm working with Mark Guggenheim, you know, it, it's, it's, I'm just working with that individual. And, and uh, it allows me sometimes, a lot, a lot of days, it allows for one to sort of inform the other. Um, you know, the biggest difference is, is you can't really be, when things settle down and things are going well, you have to go work on the thing that's a problem. And so you don't always get to sort of, but that's a small price to pay. You don't get to sort of sit back and have those days where you're sort of like, wow, everything's working, it's all going great, you know? Um, you kind of have to go, and there's always some, production issue or script issue or story issue or cut issue you know, that's coming up um, that you, you kind of go settle on or uh, deal with. Um, you know, one thing that's always shocking to me and, and where Peter is, uh, you know, I think le legend in the business is that he watches and sees everything. In fact, I know several executive producers where he's seen more of their episodes than they've seen. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and later in the years, you know, you'll still get notes and scripts from him, and, uh, you know, and, 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 and everybody gets a personalized Christmas card, which no one knows when does he start writing those, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, and, and the reason I, I say that as an example is every executive that I work with, at the studio and the network, they're all working on multiple shows, and they're figuring out ways to, you know, put their kids to bed and read three scripts that night. And, and it's, it's not dissimilar to, to, I think, a lot of people in this business who I, I think also just the way the business is built more now, that you just, everybody has to figure out a way to do different things. It's you're not just working on sort of on one thing. And so everyone's kind of figuring out ways to manage multiple things. And, and I'm certainly not alone in that. In a strange way, I really believe, I've said this to many executive producers, that we have the same jobs. You know, we, we are in leadership roles overseeing, in my case, let's call it shows. In Greg's case, it's also shows, but it's also the departments, the many, many, the hundreds of people that report to him. And it's our job to lead, to hopefully to inspire, to galvanize, to bring out the best in them all, to discipline, to 
impose limits, to do all the things that what is, that's, that's required to be, I think, a good leader. And I, I really believe we have very, very similar jobs. I almost hesitate to ask this because I'm afraid of for your sleep, but you have more projects coming up. When are you going to find the time to do this, and what do you have up your sleeve? <laughs> Uh, we're, it's development time, so scripts are just starting to come in. So this is that time where I, I start seeing scripts right before he starts seeing the scripts. Uh, and uh, we've got five or six things that we uh, sold out there, all of which we're really excited about. Uh, um, there's a, a gentleman named Roberto uh, Sarcasa uh, who we, uh, um, we work with on Supergirl. He's written both Riverdale uh, that he wrote last year that we had at Fox, and we moved over to the CW, which is really exciting. He wrote another script for us uh, that I just got, actually, and I'm doing notes on tonight. It, uh, it's very, I haven't read it yet. I like I'll, I'll, I'll leave it right now. Uh, uh, called Brides, which is very exciting for NBC. Uh, and uh, we, we've got you know, multiple ones. But you, the fun part about this year, truthfully, is you, it's a, you never know. You, know. you start with pitches, and, and everybody's sort of excited about this or excited about that. And then the scripts come in, and, and maybe one project sort of moves a little bit ahead of the other. And then it gets read by the studio and then read by the network. And, and suddenly, one leaps out. You know, a blind spot's a great example of that last year. You know, uh, it was we took the pitch around. Um, I, think we, I think we sold it to one place. I think it was just Perlina at NBC That's right. uh, you know, uh, who wanted it. And uh, Martin just wrote such a wonderful script. And to go back to your earlier question, you know, just about how com competitive things are and how much there's too much quote unquote TV. A lot of actors I meet with now, you know, they want to do 13 episodes of something because they want to still maybe do a movie or they want to. And, and Jamie Alexander and Sullivan Stapleton were two of the, you know, I, I wasn't even sure if you could get them for a cable project. They were so the most sought after um, actors last year. But Martin wrote such a phenomenal script that it attracted everyone. And it really helped elevate it through the development process through the, you know, uh, and then obviously through the casting process and hiring directors. And it was all about the, his execution of the material. And uh, he's really, it's, it's been true throughout, to be honest, to just watch him. And that's, that's an example of what Peter's talking about, of where I sort of function like he does. I'm Martin's first audience in a lot of ways and trying to impart when I can, you know, what I've learned about this experience or that experience. But, you know, I have to embrace his vision and I've been really fortunate enough to, to work with someone like him. And, and so um, anyway, yeah, so, so th that's how I, this time of year, how I, I sort of focus on the projects is, is through the, the people. Oh, 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, being that you're not vertically integrated or attached to any network, what does that mean for you from a free creative freedom standpoint? Do you see yourself being able to shop to uh, cable or streaming? Well, it's one of the great privileges of being a part of Warner Brothers. Um, I, I worked with Stephen Cannell for many years, and I learned the value of independence. And I think what, what's critical about independence is, is that the creative community often responds to it. Nobody wants to be dictated to, you know, where there is an assumption, a tacit agreement, if you will, if you're vertically aligned, that you're going to bring that idea to the network with whom you're affiliated. It's just, again, it's not the way the process works best. It's not the way the consumer watch it. Nobody, you know, nobody chirons, well, we wanted to bring this to a different network, but you see our vertically integrated corporate imposition. No, that's not the way it works. Freedom is so important. Again, it's our job to bring in the likes of this fabulous man and some of the other people we're privileged to be able to work with and give them, we just say, dream. What are you most passionate about? What's the idea that's burning? I, 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 when, when J.J. Abrams, as an example, with whom we're also lucky enough to work, comes to my office and says to me, it physically hurts me that I can't direct this. I'm in. It, you know, that passion is so critically important to add restriction to homogenize the thinking, to impose an agenda, a corporate agenda that makes no sense, I believe is antithetical to the creative process. So the freedom that we enjoy, and we are a 50% owner in one network, but we never impose on, our, on any of our producers that they have to bring an idea to this particular network. Rather, together as partners, and Greg and I have done this a lot, we'll ask ourselves, where do we think this show best belongs. We'll evaluate the offers that have been made. 
it's not only and always about just the cash or the best deal, but rather, where is the network that has expressed the greatest enthusiasm? Like, tell the story of Supergirl. Well, I was, I was going to yeah. say this year, I always get ex interested and excited by pitching season because there's who you think is going to be interested in the thing. And, and then you go out, you pitch it, and you can see their face during the pitch that they're just, they're not going to buy this. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of, you're also, you've gone in with all that belief of like, this is the place, you know, this is the, and so I immediately go out of the meeting. If it's another uh, woman or man that's pitched it, you know, I turn to them and I say, don't worry, don't worry, it only takes one. We can only air it on one <laughs> network. We can't air it on multiple, don't worry. And, uh, but meanwhile, I'm thinking a little bit inside, like, gosh, why were they interested? You know, I, I thought that was going to be the home. And, but then, the other is true too. So this year with both shows, you know, I thought uh, Blind Spot, uh, uh, it was called Blind Spot in the Pitch. I said they are actually already have a show that's a thriller with a BL in the first title. They're not going to be interested Same number of in Blind Spot. Yeah, and so, uh, and, but they were. And, uh, and then Supergirl, you know, I, I don't think we ever discussed or thought about CBS, and Nina wouldn't even let us leave the room really. Um, and just so saw it at, on that network and, and saw that, that was what I was talking about earlier, that shared passion mm -hmm. for the thing. And other people create TV you know, their own way, but for me and the shows that I'm a part of, again, I, it has to be, you have to, why I love being at a place where you do sell to everyone and you don't know, and even though there's that period of uncertainty of not knowing, um, it inevitably has the best shot at ending up at the place where people are the most passionate about it. And so, so you're willing to sort of forego that um, because on the other side, you get people who are truly equally passionate about this thing uh, that, you're, that you're making. And so that, that's, that, that's the, the joy of it. I, I call it, for me, it's called, I, I think of it as making TV from the inside out as about focus on the idea and the, and the quality and the story and then worry, let the sort of chips fall where they may and about where it's going to end up. Um, one of the great things that Brandon Tartikoff taught all of us when he was alive was that all great shows, all hit shows, have to have a champion somewhere within the network. And I, I, I so remember, we, we were surprised, I think, Greg and I, at, at the pitch of Supergirl at CBS. When Nina Tassler started weeping at a particular moment in the story that Greg happened to tell so beautifully, a, a seminal moment between a mother and a daughter. It so affected her, she literally started weeping. And I remember looking at Greg and afterwards, we walked down and we said, this is where we have to be. How, how can you not respond to somebody for whom it's such an important project? And that's, it, it's a good lesson, I think. And it seems to have working out. Mm -hmm. So far so good, yeah. So so it's good. nice to have you know, partners who believe in what you're doing. Wonderful. All right, I want to open it up to Q&A from the audience, if you guys have any questions. Raise your hand. Thank you, guys. Um, I should ask, has there been a show either on the air now or in the past that you're like, damn, I wish I had done that show, that you were, you were jealous that you, you had been involved with that show? What would that be for you guys? That's a great question. You go sure. first. Well, <laughs> I, I, had the, uh, I had the experience of having been at a network where I was in a buying position and the one that got away, and the one that I, I don't regret my decision, but I think you'll understand why I feel so terrible today that I passed on The Sopranos. <laughs> yeah, not a good decision. Okay. Um, at the time, I was at Fox, and the reason why, I happened to know David Jacobs, he worked with my mentor, Stephen Cannell. I thought the script was brilliant. And the reason that I passed is because I thought, we're going to neuter it. We can't possibly give this idea the freedom that it requires. And I'm not just talking about the level of, of violence, but rather the language and, and just the rawness of the story. I thought would be so restricted by being on broadcast television that I opted not to do it. And I'm not sure I made the right decision. <laughs> For me, I just say it's not so much, um, there's not one that's coming to the top of my head, in, except that every year there's always a pilot script that I read that I want to throw across the room because it's so good, and you think, oh gosh, like that's, and it reminds you, for me, it reminds me why I'm doing it, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and so uh, I, uh, as an example, there was a, a small show, this is, this is sort of how I met Martin, 
Um, I loved LA Complex when it was on CW. No one was watching it, and I called Martin in, and he's like, no one's, you're the one that's watching the show. <laughs> I've met you, I've finally met you. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, he, he told me the day after Blind Spot premiered on, on NBC, he, he called me and he said, you know, this, the number of viewers who watched the show last night were greater than all of the viewers <laughs> combined that watched uh, and anyway, but I loved the show and I loved the writing and I just uh, called him in and said, you know, what can we, what can we work on together? And so uh, that would be an example. That's great. That's like the Tina Fey like <coughs> I'd like to thank the dozens and dozens of people who watch our show. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? You talked about the, the, the narrow gap between film and television and um, given that you know that audiences are discovering these shows sometimes uh, week by week, sometimes they're watching them all a few months, maybe a couple of years down the road. I'm just wondering how that is starting to affect the process of how people are going to be watching these. Does, does it change at all, I guess, knowing how many people are watching all these shows in different ways now? Yeah. If I think, if I'm understanding your question correctly, I think the important point of what you're saying is, is that for the first, I mean, again, I've been doing this for 40 years, and I've watched, I began my career at a time in which we were really the stepchild of entertainment. You know, not many people, not the, people looked down on television, even broadcast television, as even though we were doing and reaching upwards of 30 million viewers on a weekly basis. It just wasn't the area in which the best stories were being told, or so they thought. So you would go to the movies for that experience. What's happened now is that as the movie business has changed, and as an entire almost middle class of film, a particular kind of film in, in a range that normally had been made in years past, started to evaporate, more and more and more filmmakers started coming to television. I mean, that's, I believe, what enables us to really be experiencing this renaissance, this golden age of television. Now, more than ever before, I don't know of any major m filmmaker that is not interested in some fashion in working in television. So it, it's, a, it's a great time to be in television. I, I'm not sure that I've answered your question. Yeah, no, it's true. Okay. shows that you're making yep. in more of a film manner because they can want because they have that luxury of being able to watch it all at yeah. once if they want. Yeah, I mean we always talk about the series at the beginning of the year we do talk about it almost like a movie we'll sort of say what's the narrative for the year and the, there's always kind of a beginning and a middle and an end to that to that narrative. I think you're mindful of we're mindful of when we're going to be off the air and the first episode and the last episode mid-season finales have become more of a thing on the kind of broadcast shows that we do, especially action adventure kind of shows, uh, so that you know you leave people with a sense of like, oh gosh, I have to come back. But I, I just know about, I always, my first line of information is just how do I watch TV? And <clears throat> there's shows, a lot of shows now, that I wait to binge watch and I go, oh, I'll wait for two or three episodes so I can watch three episodes at once. And then I feel guilty and I'm like, no, I should watch it on air. And then I think, well, I don't have a Nielsen box, who cares, you know? And uh, um, <laughs> you've just seen inside my brain for a second. Um, but, um, but the truth is that you try, and we're always trying to figure out ways to get people, I still care about the, I, I still worry about the ratings the next day and, and I'm always trying to get people to figure out ways to get people to watch the shows, you know? create the kind, especially in the nature of the kind of shows that, that we do. Uh, but we do, we do think about them at long form also, in terms of like when they're gonna be binged in that way. The long story for many of our writers, producers, creators is really an appealing idea. I, 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 one of the most interesting lessons that I learned was when I first came to Warner Brothers and I had the privilege of working with Aaron Sorkin on the West Wing. And I remember saying to him, why are you doing this? I mean, I'm thrilled. I think audiences are gonna love this, but why? And he, he talked about the fact that he was involved in a movie that he wrote called An American President, in which he felt as if there were many, many more stories to tell. And then he felt very actually restricted by the two-hour form. 
and he wanted to peel the onion skin and really get to know behind the scenes look at all of those people that helped shape and make the president who, who he is. So that long story, that ability to really dissect a character, to offer the complications and the complexities of a, of, of, of a real living human being. I mean, if you think about the things that Greg has accomplished on Flash, on Arrow, on Everwood, on all of the shows, there's an evolution and an organic growth of the characters that is fascinating to the audience. You know, it's a very simple idea. If you love television and you're invested in certain characters, you want to know everything there possibly can be about those characters. It's part of the reason why origin stories have such a powerful place in audiences' hearts. You love a character, I want to know where are they from? What shaped them? Why are they who they are? And that's the brilliance of what I think of what well, Greg I think does. Com comic book shows in particular lend themselves to, to TV. In some ways, I think that genre is almost even suited better in television mm -hmm. than it is in movies. And that it, haven't been a big fan of comic books as a kid. It's just a very similar narrative. I mean, we're doing cross. We do these crossovers every year. And and to me, I was reading crossovers in back in when I was reading Secret Wars and Crisis of Infinite Earths. It was all of the characters kind of crossing over and mashups. And 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 some of what we're doing in the on the shows is is just ripped right out of and just in terms of how they tell the narrative, right out of of comic books themselves. Female showrunners and female writers. So there's always stories that you know there need to be more women in television. Do you have any advice for a young writers starting out? Not me, but someone in my family. <laughs> it feels almost like there's sort of um, uh, sort of two separate questions about it. Is one in particular female writers and and what their situation is in the business right now or whatever, and uh, and then also how what might one uh, a young writer um, you know start out? And uh, I would say of we have, I don't know, I haven't counted exactly, but we probably have as many female writers on, on our action shows as we do males. Um, and so I've never sort of been in my own mind. Um, I, I find that, in fact, in my experience doing Everwood through the years and Dawson's, and that, that there were a lot more women who could write emotional stories and drama and comedy. You know, it was just more, they were more, ex access, all of that was more accessible to them. Uh, and so I always gravitated in a lot of ways to that. And I, I, there's just as many women in our camp that write action and those things really well too. So, so my, to answer your second part of your question, for me, I, I don't think it's any, I don't really believe it's any kind of different in terms of uh, what a young writer might do to sort of, and by young, just someone who doesn't have as much experience might do differently based on their gender. I think they have to, the, the best advice I would give them is to write stuff that's personal to them that they care about because then when they have to do the rewriting and all the other process, they actually aren't just thinking that, okay, well, this is popular, so I should write this, but they're actually something that they care about. And I've found through the years that those are the scripts more that introduce people to other people, um, that there's something unique and special about their voice and, and that they can best find, you know, what kind of show might suit them then. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, then they know that much, you know, they know what they're, what they're good at. I don't know the answer. No, I think that's a great answer. Right, one last question for you guys. What was your favorite show growing up? Oh my gosh. I, I had so many favorite shows. I, again, I, I, I was one of those kids that used to fake being sick every day <laughs> so that I could watch from sunrise to sunset. I, I loved All in the Family. I love Superman. You can do the intro to Superman. I can. Yes, it's Superman, strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal man. <laughs> Superman, who can bend steel in his bare hands. And who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. Some would say I was obsessed. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I think my favorite thing about it was, it, there were so many different ones, but for me it was, and it's a little bit of a lost art form, and I, I, I try and encourage it with our shows, but 
a big memory for me is just watching shows with my family. So whether we were watching Happy Days or we were watching uh, Eight is Enough or we were watching Family Ties, you know, whatever the show was, and it would sometimes stimulate conversation, but it was a shared communal experience. And now with everybody just watching things on their different devices and, and, and things are so, you know, isolated and, and geared toward, we try and make shows, and one of the fun parts about my job is trying to make shows that people can watch together. And I love, love, love it so much when I have uh, uh, you know, a, a, a daughter and a father or a son and a mother tell me how much they love to watch a show and that they both have a shared experience. That, that's the most, to me, the most rewarding part. The reason why this man is not only my, my dear friend, but I look at him as a son is because I worked on those shows I that know he watched. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of others. A lot of others, too, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, wonderful. I can't think of a better note to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you wonderful. Guys. Thanks. Thank you, guys. If you're so sick and all